Turnabout Goodbyes is the perfect conclusion, and in this video I'm going to explain why. But first, we have to go back. Back to DL6. Well, actually, a bit before that. When Phoenix Wright was in elementary school, the students would bring all their lunch money for the month in an envelope. Miles Edgeworth, his classmate, had his lunch money stolen during P.E. Wright had missed P.E. class that day, and was thus the only one without an alibi. Everyone believed that Wright was the one who committed the crime, but Miles Edgeworth stood up for him, saying that everyone was accusing Wright without any evidence. Edgeworth's father was a famous defense attorney, and Miles wanted to be just like him. However, the class didn't give up on accusing him until another classmate, Larry Butts, also stood up for Wright. In the end, the teacher ended up replacing the money herself. The trio would become good friends afterwards. On December 28, 2001, Gregory Edgeworth boarded an elevator with his son, Miles Edgeworth, and a courtroom bailiff, Yanni Yogi. This came after Gregory had lost a case against fearsome, undefeated prosecutor Manfred von Karma. Despite losing, Edgeworth managed to prove that von Karma had blackmailed someone, leading to von Karma receiving a penalty, and not jail time somehow. The only one on his perfect record, ruining it. Suddenly, an earthquake struck the courthouse, and the elevator was stuck as the power to the building was cut. The elevator slowly ran out of air, leading to Yanni Yogi fighting Gregory Edgeworth. Wanting to stop the two from fighting, Miles Edgeworth picked up a pistol that had dropped from Yogi's belt and threw it towards them. Then he passed out. By the time he awoke, his father was dead and Yanni Yogi had been arrested for the crime. The police used a spirit medium in an attempt to have Gregory identify his killer. He said the man who killed him was Yanni Yogi. At his trial, Yogi got off on a plea of insanity. The use of a spirit medium was leaked, and both the police's and the spirit medium's reputation was ruined. Edgeworth would be taken in by Prosecutor Von Karma and molded into his protege. Phoenix and Larry Butts wouldn't see Edgeworth again for years. Phoenix would meet Edgeworth again in 2016. In the 15 years that had passed, Edgeworth would come to be known as the Demon Prosecutor. He was undefeated, just like his teacher, Von Karma. He also only cared about getting a guilty verdict, never about the truth. In this first meeting with Edgeworth from the player's perspective, Edgeworth uses really dirty tactics. He withholds information constantly, tries to strong arm the judge, and most infamously, updates the autopsy report. Edgeworth even goes along completely with indicting his former good friend for murder. He instructs his witness to lie in order to improve his case. And considering this witness ended up being the true killer, it's not a good look. Someone of Edgeworth's intelligence had to know that Red White was the true killer. However, in the end, Phoenix Wright prevails, getting both him and his original defendant off the crime, handing Edgeworth his first ever loss. The penultimate case of the first Ace Attorney game is where we really get to see how this loss affected Edgeworth. This case portrays Edgeworth in a lot more of a comedic light, mostly due to the fact that basically every witness outside of the culprit is pretty ridiculous. I mean, you have Old Bag flirting with him constantly, much to his chagrin, you have Salmonella being a sweaty gamer nerd, and Cody Hackins is a typical fanboy. However, the final day of the trial is where you really see the change in him. Wright is up against a corner. He knows D. Vasquez has to be the true killer in this case, but he can't prove it. That's where Edgeworth comes in. He asks the witness, his own witness, to testify again in quite a comedic scene. This testimony is what allows Phoenix to find the contradiction and prove that she is the true killer. After the trial, Edgeworth is quite different. He feels conflicted. The old Edgeworth from grade school is starting to come out again, replacing the von Karmified version of him. Of course, this all leads into the finale case, the subject of our video. So, in a bit of a rarity for these videos, I'm going to do some analysis at the start of the summary. But first, watch the intro scene.
This is, in my humble opinion, one of, if not the greatest intro scenes in the entire series. Let me explain why. It starts off incredibly mysteriously. Unlike any of the other intros in the game, you don't see any characters, or know the names of any, in detail until the very ending. Merry Christmas has got to be one of the straight up coldest lines ever delivered in Ace Attorney, and then the slow pan up to reveal the main character of the game, Miles Edgeworth, whew, it's just perfection. The sound design here is insanely well done as well. The DL6 music is tied for the best reminiscence theme in the game for me, and they cut it out at the perfect time so that it's silent for the gunshot and the splash in the water. Then the suspense theme of course works quite well as you slowly start to realize who's holding the gun. Then the fade out that leaves you with so many questions. It's just perfect. Turnabout Goodbyes begins on Christmas morning, with Phoenix and Maya having a discussion about Maya's training. However, news of the murder at the lake quickly make their way to Nick and Maya. The two rush over to the detention center. Edgeworth isn't particularly happy, which is to be expected, but he unexpectedly denies Wright's request to defend him. Therefore, the two set off to Gord Lake, where they find Detective Gumshoe. Gumshoe is basically the only police officer who believes in Edgeworth's innocence. Gumshoe is called off, but he gives Wright permission to investigate and also tells him where he works. Maya pops a party popper, try to say that 10 times as fast, which sets off a camera and makes my microphone's pop filter do some work. The player then meets Lotta Hart, who was quite annoyed by this, as it made the camera run out of film. Should probably get a better camera, Lotta. We learn that the camera had been set up the night of the murder, and Nick asks her to look for any shots she had of that night. At the precinct, we receive the autopsy report and talk to Gumshoe some more. When seeing the victim, Maya recognizes him as someone who worked at the Grossberg Law Office. We then go back and meet Lotta Hart and receive a photo of two men on a boat in the middle of the Gord Lake. We then meet good old Larry Butts, who was working at a hot dog stand. Wonder if he'll come up later. Well anyway, he shares some of the information about Edgeworth's past that I shared earlier. He also mentions Gordy, something I've neglected to mention so far. Gordy is kind of like the Loch Ness monster, basically. Anyway, we go to the Grossberg Law Office and learn that the victim is named Robert Hammond. He was the lawyer for Yanni Yogi and the DL6 incident. Grossberg gives us a photo of the spirit medium involved in the incident, Misty Fay, Maya's mother, so we could get Edgeworth to talk. Once shown the photo, Edgeworth came clean about the DL6 incident, sharing what I told you earlier. He also tells us that because of the statute of limitations, DL6 would be closed in three days. He then takes Wright on as his defense. Then an earthquake hits and Edgeworth collapses into a ball. The trial began the next day. Wright's opponent would be Manfred von Karma, Edgeworth's mentor and the undefeated for 40 years prosecutor. First to testify is Gumshoe, who testifies that Edgeworth was arrested on the spot. From him we gain a bullet and the murder weapon, a pistol adorned with fingerprints from Edgeworth's right hand. The ballistic markings on the bullet match the gun. Lotta Hart comes to the stand next, and this is where Von Karma is at perhaps his most intimidating. Hart testifies that she saw two men on the boat, and every time Phoenix tries to press her, Von Karma instantly objects. He even threatens to hold him in contempt of court if he continues. Thankfully, Maya takes the hit for Phoenix and asks Hart if she clearly saw Edgeworth. This gets her arrested, but it works. Phoenix is able to prove that due to the conditions of that night, it wasn't possible for Hart to clearly see Edgeworth. The photograph she provided didn't give much either. It's revealed that Hart was actually looking for Gordy that night. When she heard the gunshot, she thought it was Gordy and didn't actually see the boat that night. That's enough to make her testimony unreliable, but her photograph isn't. However, Phoenix uses the photograph to show that the person is holding the gun in their left hand, while Edgeworth's right fingerprints are on it. This is enough to buy the defense another day and prolong the trial. I'll start to speed things along here, as this investigation has quite a bit of time wasting. Namely, there's a big section of it where you need to give Lotta Hart information about Gordy, so she can share some information about the trial to you. Once Phoenix proves that Gordy was actually a mistake made by none other than good old Larry Butts, Hart reveals that Von Karma's next witness is going to be the caretaker of the boat rental shop. Upon meeting him, it's clear that he's just a harmless, senile old man and nothing else. 
He mistakes Wright and Maya as his children and believes that he's the owner of a pasta shop. We learn nothing from him, but thankfully he's got a friend, Polly the Parrot. When Maya asks Polly the Parrot, have we forgotten something, Polly replies with, don't forget DL6. The duo go outside to discuss this, but when they re-enter the boat shop, it's locked. Wright and Maya tell Gumshoe about this. The old guy is somehow involved with the DL6 incident. Gumshoe permits them to go into the evidence room and learn more about the DL6 incident. It is there that they learn most of what I shared earlier. At the trial the following day, Von Karma called the boat caretaker to the stand as expected. The man said he couldn't remember his name or much about his past. In his testimony, the caretaker said that after hearing a gunshot, he looked out and saw a boat. He had then seen a man walking by the window outside. He also claimed that despite the fog being thick, he saw the man's face and was sure it was Edgeworth. Wright tries to object to this, but they're all overruled. Edgeworth is declared guilty and we lose. Until good old Larry Butts appears to save the day. He says that he heard the gunshot too, and in an unprecedented move, the judge allows the trial to continue, and Butts' testimony will be heard. After a short recess, it's time for Larry to testify. He claims that he only heard one gunshot, which contradicts what we've heard before. He also says that he was listening to the radio at the time, and the DJ was saying, hey, it's almost Christmas. This fact allows Wright to argue that the real murder took place earlier than we thought. See, Lotta Hart's camera, which was set to go off at loud sounds, went off at 11.50pm, but it photographed an empty lake. Wright argues that Lotta's camera went off due to the gunshot that Larry heard, as Larry had actually heard the gunshot late on Christmas Eve. To help this point, the murder weapon was fired three times, but only two shots were accounted for at this point. Wright theorizes that there were actually two different shootings that night at Gord Lake. The first was the real murder, and the second was Edgeworth and the other person on the boat, who was the real murderer. The murderer must have invited the victim to the boat shop, which is right near where Larry was. This explains how he heard it over the radio. The real scene of the crime was the boat shop. After that, to frame Edgeworth on the boat, the killer took up the guise of Hammond, and when they got out to the lake, the killer shot twice. The first shot was to create a witness, the second shot was to fake the shooting. He then fell into the water and swam to shore. This explains why the person in the photo was firing with their left hand. The killer obviously couldn't know that Lada's camera was set to go off at a loud noise. The judge asks Wright who the killer must be, and Wright accuses the boat shop caretaker. The judge orders the bailiff to bring him back in, and while they wait, he asks Edgeworth about Wright's theory. Edgeworth confirms that he was invited out to the boat shop via a letter signed by Robert Hammond to talk about something important. Before we can get further clarification, the bailiff returns and says that the caretaker is gone. The trial is suspended to its third and final day. So in the final investigation, we learn two important things. First, there was a safe in the boat shop. Inside it is an unsigned letter. It gives instructions that are the exact same as the plan Wright theorized. It explains in detail how to kill Hammond and frame Edgeworth. When this letter is shown to Edgeworth, he explains a recurring nightmare he's been having. In his dream, he's in the elevator with his father and Yogi. As the elevator begins to run out of air, Yogi attacks Gregory in a panic, trying to prevent him from stealing his air. Miles picks up Yogi's gun, which fell on the floor, and throws the gun at Yogi in an attempt to stop the fight. Just before he passes out due to a lack of oxygen, the gun goes off, and Edgeworth hears a scream. The gun that Miles threw fired and killed his father. Moving past this depressing ass dream, Later, at the Criminal Affairs Department, Nick and Maya head to the records room, looking for info on DL6. They're especially suspicious of Von Karma now, as earlier, Grossberg said that the unsigned letter was in his handwriting. So of course, he's down there with us. Nick and Maya gather some evidence, but in comes Von Karma with a taser. Two zaps and they're both down, and Von Karma escapes with all of the evidence related to the DL6 incident, except for one bullet that Maya managed to save. It's going to be a tough final trial. The next day, the caretaker had been found and will testify. It doesn't go too well though. Wright is unable to prove that the caretaker is actually Yanni Yogi. He even burned off his fingerprints to hide his identity. Things are going nowhere. And then Von Karma jokes that Phoenix should perhaps try cross-examining the caretaker's parrot. Phoenix accepts. 
Phoenix uses the parrot and its train phrases, despite Von Karma retraining it, to prove that the boat shop caretaker is actually Yanni Yogi. Von Karma tries to continue the fight, but Yogi drops his guise as a harmless old man and turns serious. He admits to the crime. And then we all live happily ever after. Before all can be good, Edgeworth objects and admits to killing his father in the DL6 incident. As the statute of limitations runs out on the case today, a new trial will be set up. Phoenix, however, doesn't believe in Edgeworth's nightmare, and it's up to him to prove it. Things very quickly look bad, however. Edgeworth testifies that he only heard one gunshot, which can't be the truth. There's an obvious bullet hole in the glass of the elevator, and the weapon was fired twice. But of course, Von Karma pounces on this. If there's a second bullet, prove it. Well, we can't really. All looks lost. Edgeworth will be found guilty. Again. But then, Mia speaks to Phoenix through some spiritual mumbo jumbo. I don't know. Urging him to think outside the box. Completely grasping at straws, Phoenix says that the killer took the second bullet. Because he had to. He slowly gains more confidence and says that the shot that Edgeworth heard actually hit the killer outside of the elevator. Meyer remembers that Von Karma took a long vacation, the only one of his career, after the incident. This leads to Phoenix accusing Von Karma of the crime. Von Karma, of course, would be too perfect to leave evidence behind, like a bullet or a doctor removing said bullet, as a witness. So, using a metal detector we received from Gumshoe earlier, Wright is able to prove that there's something metal inside Von Karma. Von Karma's last stand comes when he says he was shot before DL6, and that it would be impossible for the defense to prove that the bullet is from DL6. This is where Maya's saved bullet comes into play. If the bullet in Von Karma's shoulder matches the rifling of the DL6 bullet we have, it proves Wright's theory. This works. Von Karma has a bit of a meltdown and admits everything. Edgeworth is declared not guilty both in court and in mind, and everyone lives happily ever after. Till the bonus case. In order to understand why this case is the perfect conclusion, you need to look at it through the lens that Shu Takami and Capcom did. There was no plan for a trilogy when the story of the first game was written, so this game was made to be entirely self-contained. Throughout the entirety of the first game, the DL6 incident hangs mysteriously in front of the player. Every single main character in the game was affected by it in some way. Edgeworth is obvious. His father was killed and the incident forced him to become a prosecutor. Phoenix lost one of his best friends, and losing him helped serve as a catalyst for him to become an attorney in the first place, to find him again. Mia would not have become an attorney without the incident causing her mother to disappear. So once again, by extension, Phoenix wouldn't have. Maya, of course, lost her mother, a fact she pretends doesn't bother her, but when the mask slips, you can see that it clearly does. Von Karma is of course obvious, and even Red White, the villain from the second case, was eventually driven to murder Mia Fey due to a chain of events that started off with the DL6 incident. This is why it's so good as a conclusion. It wraps up not only the story of the real main character of the game, Miles Edgeworth, but it also wraps up the biggest story thread of the game, and all of the main players have been affected by it. If the game had flopped sales-wise and instead was a cult classic and we never ended up getting the next two games to complete a trilogy, this story could absolutely stand alone. And it's all because of the loose ends wrapped up in this case. Manfred von Karma is the best prosecutor in the series. In a literal sense, yes, he is. Undefeated for 40 years is probably something that will never get topped in universe. Even Phoenix Wright has lost a couple of times. This guy has the biggest oh shit factor in the entire series. They use him perfectly. That first trial day is frankly terrifying. His introduction is perfect. He runs the courtroom. Even the judge bows before him. And the way he objects perfectly to literally everything you do, constantly guessing your next move, is a feeling that they'll never recreate. When I first watched this case on a Slicer video, I had no fucking clue how Phoenix was going to beat this guy, because it seemed impossible. But the way they wrote his defeat was perfect. He doesn't lose due to a lack of skill or lack of planning. He loses basically by pure chance. He literally won pretty easily until something he couldn't prepare for happened. And to be honest, nobody can prepare for Larry Butts. 
so I don't think anybody's gonna fault him there. Even after Butts' unexpected save, he still manages to cobble together a pretty good plan to get Edgeworth declared guilty. The guy straight up retrains a parrot to help. I think in many ways, Phoenix was the perfect opponent to defeat Von Karma. Manfred is a cold and calculated prosecutor. Everything is planned out in his head perfectly. But Phoenix is a lawyer who shoots off the cuff and believes fully in his clients. His trials are usually quite crazy. Phoenix is the only lawyer that could defeat Von Karma. His ability to bluff and think outside the box are unparalleled. I honestly don't even think Mia Fey could have done it. Phoenix is the yin to Von Karma's yang. They're perfect adversaries in that way. Von Karma is literally the anti-Phoenix right. They are exact opposites, and I think that was done intentionally. Yanni Yogi is a cold and calculated man with a deep hatred of Robert Hammond and a desire for revenge. That's what drives him. I don't like his fake personality where he constantly falls asleep, purely because it wastes my time, but from a story perspective, it's quite good. DL6 ruined his life, and he didn't even do it. He lost everything, even his fiance, and he was forced for years to pretend to be an insane old man. He's arguably the most sympathetic killer that Ace Attorney has ever had. I don't even think he cares that he's going to prison. In his eyes, he's been a prisoner for 15 years, locked behind the bars of a society that thinks he's a killer, forced for 15 years to be someone he's not. Von Karma's plan was freedom for him. Edsworth's role in this case is fantastic. This is the conclusion to his character arc. Two cases of build-up and a few flashbacks all led to this for him. And yes, this sounds strange, as he appears in every main game except one, but Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, the first one, is a game about saving Miles Edgeworth, and this is a case where you literally save him. DL6 and his belief that he killed his father has been eating him alive for years, and this is the case where it all comes to a head. At the start of the case, he wants to protect Wright from DL6, but I think he might have figured out what I mentioned in the last section. Wright is the perfect opponent for Von Karma. Deep down, I think he may have wanted to be found guilty. The fact that the statute of limitations was approaching so fast likely made him feel trapped. This is just a theory, a game theory, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Throughout the entire game, there are two sides of Edgeworth battling. The side that wanted to be like his father, and the side that was forced to not. Here, once again, two sides of Edgeworth battle. The side that feels guilty, and his own self-preservation. It says a lot about the relationship that him and Nick have, that Phoenix was able to make him believe in his own innocence, when not even Nick was entirely sure what the hell he was talking about. It also really adds to the emotional stakes of this chapter to have someone you know well in the defendant role. This is the first of many times that this is used, but it's a really good one. You don't really give a shit about the other defendants in this game. Like at the first case, Phoenix cares about Larry, but the player obviously doesn't yet. Second case, again, Phoenix cares about Maya, but the player doesn't really know her yet. This contrasts quite heavily with both Case 2 of Justice For All and Turnabout Goodbyes. Ask yourself, would this case really be considered so good if someone other than Edgeworth was the defendant? I don't think so, for the reasons I just outlined. They really pulled out all the stops for this one, and it worked perfectly. The general mystery of this case is perfectly fine in my opinion. It's not all that difficult to solve or anything. Like, it's pretty obvious that the caretaker is Yanni Yogi, after his parrot basically snitches on him. Von Karma being the true culprit is made exceedingly obvious as well, but let's not pretend like this isn't the norm for Ace Attorney. The case's luster comes not from its mystery, but from its organic difficulty. There's no, haha, now you'll immediately lose if you press someone, or get this wrong. It's all difficult due to the skill of the other prosecutor. This is something they've never done since, which kinda sucks. The best part of this mystery is of course trying to decipher exactly what happened during the DL6 incident. Being able to help out a friend and put to bed a 15 year old mystery is great, especially against such a fearsome foe. Before we end this video, I'll go over some things that I'd change about this case. 
This case is incredibly good, but nothing is perfect, and there's quite a few things that I'd improve. And yes, I know the title says that it's perfect, but yeah, whatever. First off, I'd mostly cut out the Gordy nonsense. It's kind of integral to the case, it's the entire reason Lotta Hart even had her photos, but I think it's a bit too prominent and out of place for such a serious chapter. Another thing I'd like to change is actually something during case 2. When they're hyping up Edgeworth and whatnot, have a throwaway line that mentions he was trained by Von Karma. Let's get him in the mind of the player early, so that when they find out they're facing him in court for this chapter, it can make them a bit more nervous. Genuinely, I think that these are the only two things that could have a noticeable improvement in the quality of this case. It really goes to show how truly great it is, which is exactly why I think it's the perfect ending for the first Ace Attorney game. Thank you for watching. On the left is a video I think you may enjoy, and subscribe on the right if you'd like. I'll see you next week.